I'd like to now go to our second presentation. Um, we're going to hear about prognostic tools in uh, non-melanoma skin cancer from Dr. Greg Daniels, who is at UCSD with me. So, Greg, I will let you take it away. Thank you, Dr. Park. It um, was a nice introduction to the next step. Once, once the uh, lesion comes out, um, how do we start thinking about it? Okay. So, um, as Sue mentioned, I'm uh, with her at uh, UC San Diego. And I'm a medical oncologist, um, so I make that claim um, just to let you know where I'm coming from. I see some of the uh, questions in the chat are um, about prevention, which are good topics too. Um, I don't think our, our show is going to talk about that much, um, but maybe we can get to some of that in the end with Dr. Yu's uh, dermatology experience. So, um, I'm, uh, even though the session's um, entitled uh, Non-Melanoma Skin Cancers, I'm really going to hone down on um, cutaneous squamous cells um, for my talk. And um, as an indication for um, Mohs, as said, um, there are um, a lot of cutaneous squamous cells diagnosed in the U.S. And, and honestly, we don't have a good handle on the number. Um, that a million cases per year is really a, an estimate because many squamous cells um, are taken care of in family practice or by primary care physicians and uh, may not um, end up on registries uh, and reported, but um, they're very common. Um, number two, right behind uh, basal cell carcinomas. Um, but we also know that um, while many and most are cured by surgery, including most techniques, um, some recur, um, some recur often, um, and some can even spread. Um, and because it's so common, even though the incidence of recurrence and spread is low, it ends up being a substantial number of patients end up having um, significant uh, issues with uh, cutaneous squamous cell and even uh, uh, dying of uh, cutaneous squamous cells. So the challenge is um, in that haystack of cutaneous squamous cells, finding um, those tumors that are really most dangerous to patients. So I'm going to lead in with a case, a uh, gentleman who, um, like the uh, case presented on Mohs, had a lesion near his eye. And um, it came up fairly quickly, um, ended up being biopsied and shown to be a, a a squamous cell in this case. And so um, this right upper lid lesion, sorry about my abbreviations, um, underwent um, surgical resection with Mohs technique, um, got it cleared. Um, but this um, was a uh, worrisome lesion for a couple characteristics. Um, one was that uh, this tumor um, had um, the propensity to touch the nerve nearby. And so we call that perineural invasion. But, uh, the pathologist also noted that it was poorly differentiated, which is a term we use for tumors that don't really behave much like the original cell that they came from. So original cells from this are the skin cells that grow up and protect us with keratin. But if a cell is, uh, cancer is being poorly differentiated, they might not make a lot of keratin, they might be growing quickly, and they just have those um, tendencies to be uh, more, aggress more aggressive. The last thing on my slide, um, there's are two things that I'm sure most of you aren't familiar with, uh, BWH and AJCC, um, but let me explain that. So as a medical oncologist, kind of um, thinking about tumors and cancers, um, in terms of buckets um, from low risk to high risk. And one of the ways we think about that is with our staging uh, criteria. So as you may be familiar with the terms, stage four are cancers that have spread through the bloodstream. Stage three often refers to cancers that are in lymph nodes. And uh, earlier stage are those that uh, may be extensive locally, but really haven't spread. So we use similar staging systems for um, cutaneous squamous cell. However, I'm just listing um, those 
factors right at the tumor because it's pretty unusual that a cutaneous squamous cell um, will present with a lymph node involved or spreading. And so really think about, the majority of patients were thinking about this T-score or a tumor characteristic. And it's really simple. How big is it? And how deep does it go? And what does it touch? So how big is it? Uh, a centimeter is about half an inch approximately. So is it less than an inch? Is it bigger than an inch, but less than you know two inches, et cetera? Um, and so those are our T-scores. Um, the American Joint Committee on Cancer is um, the staging manual that we use. So Brigham and Women's Hospital um, has developed a um, separate staging score that's based on some other characteristics besides just using a ruler. Um, and those can even uh, factor into um, the type of patient that you're dealing with. And so they have risk factors that um, also correspond to their tumor tumor scores and grading system. Well, how useful are these things? Um, not very, um, unfortunately, because what we really want to know is those tumors that um, have a tendency to spread. So thankfully, most people catch their tumors at that less than an inch size. It's handled by Mohs or, or other appropriate techniques to, to resect it, or when not resectable, on radiation. Um, but you can see that um, there's not a heck of a lot of difference between a T1, T2, and a T3 patient, at least from a population point of view. Of course, um, any individual patient, um, these are big deals. But when we're thinking about strategies to um, watch these patients or strategies to um, lower their risk of recurrence, um, these kind of differences given by our staging system are not that good. Um, similarly, even with the Brigham Women uh, Hospital staging system, um, they're not that great at distinguishing uh, which tumors we really should be worrying about. And as such, uh, people have tried to uh, come up with a whole conglomeration of um, risk factors that we can use to put people into um, low risk and high risk. And recently, another column was added just because um, called very high risk. And it's taken into those characteristics, um, the size of the tumor, but also whether the patient is a transplant patient, like that other uh, patient that was on there um, with a pretty extensive disease, which Fortunately, we see with immune suppression. Um, are they poorly differentiated? Um, you know, how deep do they go? What nerves do they touch? And all those things help us um, distinguish patients a little bit better than the um, current staging systems. So the gentleman that we presented, that 80-year-old uh, person, um, follows, you know, I'm not quite sure, uh, even on this table, where he falls because he's at risk, because he's on his face, he's poorly um, you know, poorly defined, um, also uh, poorly differentiated, uh, rapidly growing. He, you know, this thing came up over a few months, which for a uh, cutaneous squamous cell is, is pretty quick. Um, perineural invasion was noted on the biopsy, but I didn't get a report from the uh, Mohs surgeon really on how big these nerves are, which I needed um, to, to know for um, at least this table's assessment. So, um, si similarly, considering uh, continuing on with this kind of um, look at the patient, this high risk, so again, location, poorly differentiated, maybe had some nerve involvement. We're going to use Mohs um, because of the location if possible. If it wasn't possible, we might need to even consider radiation. Um, this gentleman um, was able to get negative margins, so I um, to the uh, box there. And at that point, um, he was discussed as recommended. Um, all these high-risk patients uh, will get discussed um, at a tumor board or if this is in the community. Uh, a lot of times the community has tumor boards or there's an informal discussion that takes place. And uh, we think about um, doing radiation because the recurrence in this area uh, would be pretty detrimental to the patient. And he has a high risk based on a couple of these factors. Um, but then he shows up in my office and uh, what as a medical oncologist, I give chemotherapies and other things. Um, and looking at this table, it tells me to, um, as for a very high-risk person, uh, see him back. 
Well, I usually defer to the dermatologist at this point because um, they have um, more inclination to biopsy things, and, and I think they're more useful for the patient. Uh, consider imaging if I don't, you know, if I can't monitor this uh, clinically. That just means with my fingers and and uh, talking to the patient, and make sure that they know uh, sun protection and, and self exams. So. That seems pretty inadequate, I'll tell you, um, to think about something that's being labeled as very high risk for recurrence um, to say, um, see you later. Well, uh, that's what happened to this gentleman. He see you later, um, saw him back once and he was uh, doing well. And he came back about six months later with the neck swelling um, and he had, this is a PET scan. You'll see the outline of an aggressive necrotic tumor. Uh, if you can see my pointer, as well as other lymph nodes in his neck. Biopsy confirmed that the squamous cell was back. And so still doing pretty well, uh, functionally pretty well. His jaw hurt him a little bit. And so going back um, to my uh, thinking about him, you know, is there are there better ways that I could have predicted this? And so this was a T3 or a T2B on the Brigham's and Women's uh, Hospital scale. Recently, uh, there's a, uh, a molecular stratification. So for a lot of tumors, we're getting these tools where we can look inside the cancer and tell by the expression of genes if they have a tendency to spread or a tendency not to spread. This is an example of one of those assays that can break um, the, the risk of spread down, um, not based on necessarily uh, on the um, size of the tumor, but these internal characteristics, and get an idea of um, which are those needles in the haystack that you need to worry about. However, uh, um, these are not used um, commonly yet. And one of the reasons they're not used commonly yet is they still have difficulty really finding um, that group that I think needs to be surveyed with routine imaging. So this, this is an example of, well, here's 300 patients that were at high risk based on that table I showed you. Um, they were further stratified based on this molecular assay. And based on that, um, about 8% of the patients were found uh, to be at this very high risk. And really the conclusion of this paper was, well, that means that you don't have to be as aggressive about monitoring those patients in the lower risk group and um, be more attentive to the higher risk ones. Well, we're not even sure, again, what to do with high risk or low risk in our guidelines. And what I mean by that is our guidelines, um, based on this panel discussion from the NCCN, for a low risk person, we're going to see them back. Um, this is mostly dermatologic follow-up um, every three to 12 months. For a medium or high risk patients, every three to six months. For a very high risk person every three to six months um, and then consider imaging if we can't follow them clinically. So, and the, the problem that we have right now in the field is we don't know really what to do with this information. Is if we were to image these patients, are we improving their outcome or, or not? Um, the way that um, cutaneous squamous cells spread a lot of times they're amenable to salvage techniques, which this patient had. Um, knowing that a little bit sooner than later, is that worth it? Um, do these patients need chemo or other treatments? And that's totally not defined. And so we're in a kind of an awkward stage right now um, where we're getting some uh, extra information on who to worry about for cutaneous squamous cell, but we're still not sure because we don't have prospective data telling us how to use this information and how to improve outcomes for patients. So these are my take homes um, and happy to answer uh, questions at the end um, from the audience. Thanks.